So we are here at Move It. This is technically an episode of the Duke London podcast, but we're also doing a talk live at Move It. Um, I have two wonderful guests with me, two people I've known for quite a while, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them has beaten me at basketball before, but we're not going to say who that is. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the title of the talk that we're doing today is Behind the Scenes of Success. And before we get into that, I just want to maybe have you guys introduce yourself and a little bit about who you are, what you do, why you're so successful, and uh, <laughs> and then we'll go from there. Cool. Right, I'll start. I'm Olu, Olu Alatis. I am, hi, <laughs> I am a dancer, choreographer, teacher, and mentor. Um, currently, I am an agency owner, and I run my company, and I teach full-time. And I'm just great, you know? I'm joking. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, but yeah, that's brief. Um, hi, guys. I'm Marlon, also known as Swoosh. I'm the director of Flawless. Um, I'm <laughs> choreographer, artistic director. The list goes on. But um, I enjoy and love what I do. And I'm more focused on about affecting change in people's lives and understanding what it takes to, to live this life as a career. Mm. Nice. Um, so I guess before we even get into the behind the scenes of, of success, maybe we should talk about success itself. I mean, we've kind of chatted about this before, but um, is there a point where you guys started to feel like you were successful? Do you feel like that now? How do you, let's say, how did you and how do you define success for yourself? Um, I guess for me, when it comes to success, I, I think it could be the smallest things for me. It could just be happiness, you know? It doesn't have to be a financial thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, what people tend to, to kind of surround it with. And um, with my background with Flawless coming from, you know, being recognized from a TV show, um, even though we were obviously established, yeah. like, you know, four years prior, it's one of those situations where that's not what defines it. It's more about the journey. It's more about the bigger picture. It's more about your purpose and your why. Um, so that's what it measures for me when it comes to like success, mm-hmm. you know. I think for me, it's yes, yeah, it's the point of where you reach your personal set out goals. And like Marlon said, it, it's not necessarily financial. Um, I think it's very tailored to the individual um, and what you're setting up for yourself. I think the moment that I felt the most successful is um, when I felt like I was making a change. Um, and that's because my majority of my passion lies within teaching. Um, so when I feel like I'm making a change in someone's life, and that could be the smallest thing, um, I think that's where I feel the most successful. And it's not necessarily defined by popularity or anything like that. Yeah. So, but although saying that, it, that is the case for some people, and that's neither of it is wrong. So it's, it's a personal thing. You know? Yeah, and but I guess for you guys, was that always the case or did things change you know like say when you started flawless for example mm-hmm. or something like that did you think oh when we go on a big tv show and everyone knows who we are mm-hmm. that will be everything will be fine then or like maybe even when you were younger as a dancer you kind of like i was saying in the last talk it's like you know when you first start dancing you're like i'm gonna dance for chris brown or whatever it is yeah yeah yeah. and I- then things kind of change as it gets more a bit more realistic and it's not you necessarily giving up on those dreams it's yeah, just yeah finding different meanings for success I guess so was there something that when you were younger or when you started out that was the goal and then it kind of changed the more you got into it I guess um, I'm going to sound old right now but <laughs> I guess in in the time that we were doing what we are doing there was nothing like it mm-hmm. does that make sense it was kind of like um, you you never heard of a dance crew having a fan base. You never heard of anything like that. If you had a fan base, you were a music musician or you know something else. And also, um, there wasn't an example in front of us that we could be like, oh, we aspire to be like these guys. Or you know, it was just kind of like we were actually building a scene. Um, and I'd been in the scene prior to Flawless. I had a solo career. I was working with you know multiple different companies that are well-established, well-known, and um, it's it's the journey, you know, um, and I guess for me, going on to Britain's Got Talent was at a point in our career where it was more about, okay, we had done everything that we could do or that was available to us at that window because it was an early stage for dance, um, for hip-hop anyway, and... Um, doing all the competitions, all the major, you know, and we were quite fortunate to win those competitions. And then because I was so career driven, I always wanted to make it a career. 
you know, but no one had no one had that vision really at the time because there was an example of it. So it was like, okay, you just do you you do your nine to five or you do your side hustle job, whether you're doing a part time situation and then go in or you're at college and you're still kind of managing dance. And then um, uh, we took that leap of faith and decided that you know what we were gonna pack in our jobs that we would work in in retail at the time and we were going to like try and put our all in into this whole flawless thing and then um it started to you know develop and going on to that platform gave us the national profile so it was like oh my god this is actually happening sort of thing so yes you've caught of course you think to yourself you know how there's a goal and there's a thing that you aspire to be or what, what you want to do but essentially in our time it was kind of like creating something that hadn't been done Mm. So it's a little bit different to now. Mm. Yeah, I think, yeah, mine definitely changed when I started to accept who I was as a person and when my goal started aligning with who I was as a person, mm. um, I think my definition of what success was to me definitely changed. Um, you know, when I first started dancing, I'd like between 17 I'd, and I'd say maybe 23, um, success looked like a world tour or, you know, dancing for an artist or dancing mm -hmm. for, like, a huge show. Um, and I think that's just because that's what I saw and that's what I thought that I had to aspire to do. Um, and I think when I started, as you grow up, obviously everyone realises who they are as an individual. Um, what I thought was success no longer aligned with who I was at the time. So I think naturally... It just it shifted and it changed, and I think that's the case for a lot of people, like mm -hmm. Marlon explained as well. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with that; it's part of growth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah, 100%. It def I mean, don't get me wrong. Like if Beyonce saying holler today, and I can't still, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I can't still say yes. <laughs> I wouldn't mind a world tour still, <laughs> but um, I think whether I did those things or not um, wouldn't necessarily define the criteria of whether I was successful or yeah. not yeah and i think it's definitely true what you said about having something that you uh see be your blueprint almost and like with you guys kind of like carving out that lane is like you know when you're in school or, or want to do anything you know people are like oh well what are you going to do with this and then they want to point at like a job or an industry to say like um oh, you're going to be like that. You're going to be an architect. So you can draw, you're going to be an architect or you're going to be a painter because these are things that we already see. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, I guess the kind of more outside of the box way of thinking is you can create something. And there's a, I think it's, I want to say Alan Watts that has this speech about um, like uh, doing what you love basically. <clears throat> and it's like, if you find something, it's like something that he told to students, I guess, but it's like, if you have something that you love, mm -hmm. do that and the money will come because if you Absolutely. love something that you do the chances are there's other people in the world that also love that thing mm -hmm. and they will come to if you become amazing at that thing they'll come to you to learn it they'll come mm -hmm. to you to watch it and you can kind of monetize that thing rather than chasing where the money is already going mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i think it's, it's it's nice to hear that from you because when i first came in the scene you guys were at that point mm -hmm. like you were the people that i looked at as like mm -hmm. oh this is what we could do with dance so yeah. it's interesting to hear like you guys when you started there wasn't that so you by you carving that lane where because i didn't know the scene before you guys you yeah, were already yeah. there when i came in so when i came in i was like oh well that's my blueprint is mm. people like flawless like oh yeah you can have a crew that becomes its thing and you know obviously like mm. my era was like the toy box <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah, type yeah, of yeah. thing yeah, yeah. With my old dance crew um but for us it was like it kind of gave us belief in like you know we were young and, and <laughs> idealistic but it was like well if flawless can do this and have their own thing and be in movies and stuff like that as flawless and because i think maybe if you guys would agree before that the model was more yeah you might have a crew that you train with and do stuff for fun but you're getting jobs as an individual before yeah, yeah, you're yeah. getting absolutely not like flawless are getting hired and i remember having conversations like 2007 and 8 and be like it's mad like they're not getting hired like, it's not marlon it's like flawless the whole yeah, yeah. we want to pay the whole lot of you to come in our thing mm. and it's like i guess for you to break that barrier then it gives other mm. people in our generation to the belief yeah. to do it and then the same with the next people i think um that narrative only came about because um, I had a I had a solo career and basically I was kind of like similar with what Oli mentioned earlier with regards to 
wanting to get out into the industry and wanting to work with, you know, some of the biggest names in the industry and whatnot. And then I had that experience and it was amazing. But I realized at that point that that wasn't what my goal really was. It was more just to kind of learn and get a feel of the industry and build myself up. And so I didn't feel like you know, although it felt like success, you know, when your family's watching you on TV, like, oh my God, my son's on TV, <laughs> and you get all of that, and that's great, but it's just your community of people, it, mm-hmm. and, and you realize when you get to that place that, you know, you're working with these artists, and you feel like a number, mm-hmm. and I wanted to affect change mm-hmm. in dance, because again, like I said, I've worked with all the biggest groups and companies in the UK at the time. And um, I was so passionate about that narrative of, you know, uh, being respected as an artist rather than just, oh yeah, the back end dancers sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so um, developing a brand and being able to push that out for, you know, if I work with an artist now, like now, now you're saying you're, mm-hmm. you've walked into the industry and you're seeing Flawless as being recognized as Flawless. It's because of that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that's where that kind of stemmed from. And then now it kind of opens that door for others to be like, actually, we all should be doing it. It's not a thing where it's just isolated for certain people yeah. from a TV show or whatnot. It's just like all dancers are artists and yeah. there's so much um, value that we bring when working with musicians and, you know, creatively, a lot of people need us. And um, yeah, I think that's something that should be at the forefront, which was back in the day with Rocksteady crew and so on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's just me kind of like paying homage to that and keeping that in, in, in where it should be. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. So I guess then if we talk behind the scenes of success, mm-hmm. um, I get, it, it is, I guess, two ways to look at it. So there's the way that we define success and then the way that other people define success. So, you know what you're saying about, um, you know, like maybe family members be like, oh, he's on TV, something mm-hmm. like, I've had that where some stuff that literally means nothing for me, mm. like maybe my family or something will be like, oh, that's amazing, congrats. And then the thing that means way more to me, it doesn't seem as big. So they're, they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Anyway, so, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you're not like, you're not on my wavelength of what success is. Mm-hmm. Or you don't like, just because, um, I don't know, like being on TV or something is a big deal to someone that's out of the industry because mm-hmm. it's, you know, not many people get to be on TV. But when... It, in the entertainment industry, I guess it kind of is a normal thing. So then it's like, that doesn't become as much of a big deal to us, but then something else that seems like it's not a big deal is, is because, a big deal. Yeah. yeah. So was there stuff where, you know, I guess you had to navigate that like, difference between either, I don't know, it could be management, agents, um, parents, anything where you were kind of pushed towards what other people's version of success is and you had to go, I know that seems like a really big deal, but it's not. Or, you know, it could be even mon- monetarily, you know, it's a big paycheck and you're like, yeah, but this is my drive. Or was there discrepancies between that? Do you want to go? No, no, no. You can okay. go first. <laughs> um, so when I started Flawless, we started with a manager straight away. Oh, wow. And it was, everything was in-house. And um, I remember... We used to come to um, the, the competitions, and this is the early birth. Cause it was, we wasn't doing big shows. We wasn't known or anything like that. But I started that way, and it, and I knew that I had to start that way because I wanted to attract the right people for people to recognize and respect what we're doing. And you know, we when we were getting booked or we were getting our first show. Um, we came with a rider, we came with all these things in place and it was like things that people had never heard of at the time. And I remember we was doing a massive dance event um, and it was a uh, uh, choreographer's ball at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, so I can't remember what year no, it is now. Right, yeah, you I don't remember if I would have been there. Going back like, in, oh, yeah, 2005? Of course, yeah. 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 Yeah when we, when we got there, you know, we had everything in place. We had, a, you know, our dressing room. We had food, drinks and whatnot. And um, I was quite moved and quite upset that evening because everyone was put in one room. And when I say everyone, I mean like all the other dancers. So all there was multiple dance groups that were there that, you know, with, with, with which we respected as well. Um, and they were just all shoved in one room. And then you had Flawless in an isolated room with all the trimmings and everything else. And I remember feeling like like special treatment, but it wasn't that. It was a standard that needed to be set for everyone to really realize that this is what everyone should have. It's not a thing of 
because of who we are or what we've done. It's no, this is this is what it's it just is. Just because you demanded it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, exactly. Like, and everyone else should have as well. And 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 that's what it was. And you know, um, I think those kind of scenarios was kind of like where we started to see the changes and the things that you know kind of took its toll from there. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like. Sorry, someone's it, trying to get through to me. But. Not the phone, Joe. <laughs> um, I think, it, yeah, it depends on if you feel like your success needs the validation or not. And some people yeah. do need the validation from, you know, external people to be able to validate that, yeah, I am successful. So yeah. I think it depends. Like, it, I don't think it's wrong if you do need it. Yeah. Um, and again, it just depends on what your goal is. Some things, yeah, I do. I do need validation. Like, as a teacher, yeah. like, I need to know that I'm... I'm doing it right. And that's not necessarily verbally. Yeah, it yeah. could be by what my student then goes on to do, or it could be by, I don't know, a dancer that I've booked on a job once and then they go on to do other amazing yeah. things. So not necessarily verbally. And then there's other things that I, I don't need validation for. And those things might be things that, oh, it's not because you saw me on TV or because I danced for Rihanna. And the, the, the things that you do behind the scenes, like, is what dictates those big things that people see that, that they only see that yeah, good thing as it's like success. That, that diagram of the iceberg. Yeah, with yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I think it just, it, yeah, it just depends. But I'm not gonna lie and say like it's not everything that like I don't need external validation for. Some yeah, things sure. I do, and some things I don't. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's also built-in validation in air quotes, where it's like if you're gonna go book a job, you need the choreographer to validate you in a way mm -hmm. like for you to be accepted mm -hmm. even on the thing so mm -hmm. I mean also I guess that's the thing with with in a way with art where that validation is kind of built into the industry in a way do you know what I mean it's mm -hmm. like if whether it's a movie producer or a choreographer or a casting director it can like I've been in casting things where uh, not being casted but helping out or filming or whatever where it's like you know they're checking Instagram profiles and stuff and yeah. those type of things and mm -hmm. it's like just your validation on whether we think you're a professional before you even walk in the room can yeah. can help. So it's like as much as, and I think this is, uh, tell me what you guys think of this, but I think this is where this, this uh, misunderstanding of like building your CV and building your portfolio comes from because it's like you'll get these things where you might get more chance to get uh, booked on a job or whatever if uh, let's say your Instagram is popping and you've danced with all these people and blah, 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 blah. So and that's kind of a reality in some places, you know, if you can come across as like, oh, this is a big deal, you're more likely to get in certain rooms, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think what happens is some younger dancers, and it's something I spoke about quite a few times, is like they'll do certain things for free because of like the stage that it's on mm -hmm. or whatever. And it's like, because they're just trying to get this, like in, for want of a better word, like this clout to mm -hmm. be like, oh, I've danced with this person or this thing and this thing. And it's like, yeah, but you got like... I'm trying to not swear, but like <laughs> you got screwed uh, in order to get this thing that you think looks good and mm. actually it's very transparent that it was an unpaid, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that pe I guess people are trying to, they get this vision of what success is, they get it slightly wrong and then they kind of chase that thing mm -hmm. and it's not what they want to do, it's actually not what anyone else wants them to do, but they're just like, oh, well, if I perform for free, it's on this really big stage and they'll, like, because I have the name of this theatre, that's what someone said to me recently, it's like, oh, well, if it's at this theatre on my CV, it will look good and it's like, having a theatre, even if it's a 5,000 seat, like, I've perf I performed in, in um, the Sony Centre in Toronto, it's like three and a half thousand seats, it's like, it was pretty cool to perform there for me, um, but it's like, there's no one that's ever been like, but have you performed at a big venue <laughs> for any job ever? Like, yeah, has yeah. that come up? And I've spoke to like Tally about it as like from an agent's perspective. And I mean, maybe from you guys knowing working in the industry, like, have you ever looked at someone that's performed <laughs> like based on that? Or like even the, I don't, you, you perform with Rihanna, right? At the Brits. At the Brits. Yeah. Do you feel like that makes as much difference as the rest of your choreographic body of work or? Listen, nobody has ever made reference to me dancing at the Brits because I danced at the Brits or because I danced on that specific stage. I think it was at the O2, I can't even remember. Yeah. Um, like, no one has ever made reference to that in regards to either booking me again or bringing me on board as a teacher or whatever. Like, so it's interesting when I, when I hear stuff like that because I'm like, well, 
you've done it a few times, like, has something come of it? Because yes. you do get some dancers who are quite smart yep. at yep. navigating free work yep. and using it to, uh, to their advantage to push for other stuff. Um, and you I have think, to be super selective and, and super yeah, smart. Yeah, and I think you have to be very intelligent and, dare I say, it's seasoned it's, to know how to do that. In my head, it's like playing chess. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, like this free work thing is not just, it's not like bowling. Mm-hmm. You don't just throw yeah, the ball yeah, and, and hit everything. Yeah, it's true. like chess. It's like a very deliberate move with seven moves ahead in your mind mm-hmm. when you do that one move, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So, like, for instance, I'm just going to use this example because we're here. Move it. Yeah, right? yeah. So Talk when, about it. When, you, when you give the argument of, oh, you know, the free jobs and free shows, and or I can even give the example of Dancers Delight because that's been, like, sorry, Anna, yeah. you're here, but that's <laughs> been quite a, a big thing, right? But I can attest to what Dancers Delight has given me, for instance. Like you said, it's, it's chess, right? And if I'm just looking at it from a monetary perspective... I would never do dances like again in my life. Like, what? Why do I need to do it? Like, I've done it like a yeah. hundred times. Um, uh, six. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, but I, I know what. Um, what you're what doing that it for. Has, yeah, what I'm doing it for, and I can attest to what it has given me. Same yeah. with, with move it. But um, I think again, like you have to be very smart and yeah. intelligent to know how to do it. But in general, like when you talk about commercial work, for instance. I just don't think those are the platforms where it is chess. And, yeah, you know, sure. In my opinion. Yeah, no. And it's like, I think it's kind of like, um, best example I can think of is kind of like fashion, right? Where you see a celebrity or someone wearing like um, a certain top, right? Then you see something that kind of looks like it in Primark, and then you buy that, and it's like, yeah, you kind of have the Primark version of it, but it doesn't mean that you have like the fashion sense or you have the real like. Mm. We care about that thing because it's Versace or because it's Stussy or whatever, not mm. because it look. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, when you do these jobs where you're like, oh yeah, but I was in a mu- like Marlon's in music videos. I'm also now in a music video. That means I'm like Marlon, and it's yeah. like no, but it's all the other iceberg stuff that yeah. makes Marlon Marlon. Mm-hmm. Just because I. Like for, for well, I don't know what the word is, but like I decided to do a free music video and not get paid. It doesn't just boost you onto the same level yeah, automatically, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. It's groundwork, man. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess it's it's also like this this. Well, first of all, there's no blueprint to, and I think this is the thing that you're saying about, you know, whether it's dancers light or move it or whatever. It's like you can't look at what other people have done really and copy them in terms of their on paper achievements. I think you can copy people in terms of the moves that they make. You can play chess like someone plays chess. But if you just copy the moves that someone else made, you you have to understand the game you're in for I don't know if this analogy is falling apart. But like no, I get what, I get do you know what I mean? I yeah, yeah, yeah. If I did the exact same thing that Marlon did, it doesn't mean that I would have Marlon's exactly. success. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It works for Marlon and Flawless because mm. they that's Marlon and that's Flawless. And in those mm. situations, yeah. like doing this job or this movie or whatever, mm. worked for him in that specific time at that moment yeah. for what Absolutely. they were doing. Yeah. And it's like, you could, I think the way I would look at someone like Marlon, or even you or a lot of other people that I look up to, is like, I would more try to learn from how you think it's like yeah. why did you do that oh marlon like i was literally I, about to say that yeah. when you finished talking yeah sorry yeah, yeah sure. it's like even you know like i look at flawless for stuff like branding man like even the chase the dream not the competition is like why that's not just something you walk around saying because it's fun <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. You, it's something that uh it explains your why like why are you doing this it's also a slogan it's marketing it's something that people can remember it's catchy and i'm like okay i'm not gonna go chase the goal not the other people like you know it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, i'm yeah. gonna think okay maybe there's something with the capsule or with my work where i can create something that people are going to associate with my brand that comes from the heart and mm-hmm. is something that explains why i do what i do and it's i think that's the little difference of mm-hmm. I'm not copying, I'm like, I'm like yeah, learning, yeah, yeah. I guess, you know. Yeah, 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 but course. yeah, sorry, I'll let you. No, no, um, I, what you said there was, was key. It's, it, it boils down to your why, because most people, for example, might jump on doing Britain's Got Talent and, you know, it might not be for you. So it's like you're stepping into an arena and you're just doing it because somebody else is doing it and you're not, it, it, it might actually completely go the opposite direction or it might work, you know, um, but... Essentially, if I'm stepping into an arena like, you know, Dancers Delight or um, Move It, 
I have to have my why. There has to be, there's always going to be a reason why I'm there. I would never just be doing it for the sake of doing it. If I was doing it for the sake of doing it, then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, it, there's nothing wrong with doing something for free when you have strategy in place, when you plan and you're ahead of, you know, knowing what the end goal is and so on and so forth. And um, that's that's what makes a difference with somebody that just comes to move it, for example, and wants more than, than they're actually giving or providing. It's like what value are you to somebody else? You know, what is it that you're bringing to the table? Um, and when you're in a, when you're in these sort of arenas, you may not have access to me. You may not have access to Olu and all the various amazing people that we have in the UK that could be just casually walking around in Dance of Delight, just casually walking around in. So when these people put on these um, events, you have to give them that respect because the fact of the matter is, is that they're housing some incredible individuals that you can't just be able to get reach of in, in that sort of way. And you can actually communicate and say, oh, Olu, I really loved your performance. Um, I'm performing next with this team. I want to, I want to get some feedback and you can get that direct feedback. Olu might be too busy where you might try to reach out to her and and it's not that she she wouldn't, but she might just be working on another project, and and you and you miss that opportunity. So when you're at you know events like this where you get to see a pool of people from different places, you have to think, why am I coming to move it? Who am I going to see? Prep that, and then when you come, you know, okay, cool, I've done this, this, and this, and this, and then you feel like you know what I've achieved something. Rather than thinking about money, I didn't get money for my workshop. I didn't get no. You have to think about actually what it is that you're here for and then yeah mm -hmm. agreed yeah 100 percent. um so i guess also what i find interesting is like i think i mean um, me and you had a kind of extended conversation we've I, I guess spoken more as well but you're both people that i think people look up to and see as like successful i would think of course mm -hmm. um but i so i think that's my phone. Looks very unprofessional. Very unprofessional of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, like, with people seeing you like that, is there moments when, it's similar to what we were talking about before, but where things were going really well, but you felt horrible <laughs> inside? Because yeah. I think what we, and I, I've made a point in my older years to do this, but, you know, when, I think we spoke about this, but when, it looks like you're killing it on Instagram and you're doing all these big things. It's easy for me to say, oh, things are going well. And this happens all the time. Oh, things are going well for you. And it's like, you don't know that things are going well just because you're doing all these cool things. It's like, you might be having a horrible time. So I try to make a point when I'm like, if it's an actual friend and someone that I really want to talk to, I'm like, mm. it looks like things are going well for you. Like, how are things actually? Like, and it might be that they, they are. Yeah. And it might be that you're like, yeah, like life is real tough. But I think, you know, that's an important distinction to make. And is there anything that you can kind of talk about where it seemed like you were up, but behind the scenes, it really wasn't as good as it looked? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, sure. that's that's the nature of, um, of this business. It's life. Um, sometimes life hits you and you're dealing with personal situations. And at the same time, you have a business that needs to run and everything that needs to tick over. And, you know... Um, Unfortunately, in your life, the world keeps going, so you have to kind of like get on somehow, and it could be the most tragic situations, you know, like in the pandemic, a lot of people went through a lot of stuff, and um, the one thing that stood out the most was mental health, and mental health for me has like like shot up so so fast especially since social media because obviously there's a presentation on social media that allows people to um, see you know 1% of a person's life that could seem so glamorous and then that becomes the over you know the overview of everything and um, which is obviously not a reality and I come from the old school where majority of my time was actually spent in the present with that person or you know um, so yeah, I think, you know, there's been heights in, in my career where I've had, you know, some of the most amazing things happening where I'm like, you can just pinch yourself moments, but then like I'm having a really crappy life mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you have a, 
a bad situation that you know an argument with your mum or it could be anything you know um and you have to go on stage in five minutes do you know what i mean and then you, you still have to produce a good show you've got you're an entertainer so you the showmanship still needs to uh, be seamless and it still needs to be honest and true and all that and um you have to switch on and yeah that's that's a, a big reality mm -hmm. Yeah, like Marla said, yeah, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, I'm always quite open um, about my situation because, yeah, I fell into, like, spouts of depression and, like, you know, having anxiety for, like, probably, it's been probably like, 10 years now. Um, and I think the most successful that I felt, um, which I can't remember what year it was, I just didn't care about any of the accolades or performances or videos that was happening. You almost like go into autopilot. Um, and because your brain is so used to it, like you're still going, like Marlon said, life still goes on. But really, you know, like people don't know what happens. And I think it's a really important topic to discuss in dance, because from either end, like as a leader and as a dancer, um, like people have those moments, but yeah. it's like, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. And we always do that. In, in, in dance and I think it's good that it's become such a open topic now because you'll be surprised how many people that because you've openly opened up the discussion of yeah like I, I went through depression and all of a sudden everyone's like oh my god me too oh my god me too and you know it's sad that it felt like it was like an embarrassing topic to talk about prior but I think it's amazing that like now people feel even if it's not where it should be but that little bit more you know, comfortable to at least speak about it. Um, but yeah, hundred percent for me, definitely. Is would you would you say it's um, it's a stigma of entertainment with regards to the cool factor? Because obviously, it's kind of like similar to being in school, isn't it? Like yeah. you're around friends and you're trying to fit in and you want to be accepted and all that, mm. and then the people that you're surrounded by seem like, oh, this is the, the latest trend shoe and they're coming in with their fresh shoes and then you're feeling like, I need I to get that. some new yeah, shoes. Yeah. So, well, you know, and I don't really have that. And you're yeah. putting yourself under pressure. You're asking your mom, your dad, oh my God, do you know what I mean? And you're willing to do whatever to be able to get that just to fit in. Mm -hmm. I feel like the entertainment industry has a similar feel with yeah. regards to, you know, trying to keep up. And then, it, you know, if you look at social media, it is heavily mm -hmm. entertainment as well um so it has that same sort of stigma yeah you know? I, I agree and i think i always see entertainment as we are we serve people so when mm. we perform or when we teach or when we, we're giving to mm -hmm. people right and i think when people see you as that like the expectation is there from the spectator and of yourself as well like i have to make people happy i have to teach i have to and that's why every couple of years I, I actually take a break from teaching because if my cup is empty i can't give i can't give no one nothing so yeah I, marlon is right like when you have that expectation of yourself and people have that of you um, it's almost like, well, I, I have to smile. Like, mm. everyone always knows me as, like, the jokey, like, yeah. five-foot-one girl who's always bouncing up and down, so you have to keep up appearances. Um, where now I think people are a bit more open. If, if I'm, mm. And I think also there's maybe something where people, like, project onto you what they think being in your shoes is like in a way mm -hmm. like it's like me seeing Marlon or you guys and like you're at a show or something and then you've just done the performance and I'm inside I'm not jealous but like I'm like oh that's where I want to get to or whatever mm -hmm. so then when I see you and I'm like oh how's it and you're like yeah well and I'm like no no you're killing it no no you're, you're doing it and it's like it's no you yeah. yeah it's almost like no you're having a good time because I have to believe that that's a good time. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah. like, that's what I want badly. And that's so what I think the answer to all my problems is, is being in your shoes. You know, it's like when I find this, when people talk about celebrities, even like when Justin Bieber was going through all his like wild years or whatever. And it's yeah. like, people are like, oh, how can he have problems? He's a celebrity, he's rich. And it's like, just cause you're projecting that you think money and fame is the answer to all your problems. You're like, mm -hmm. people are still human and they still have issues. So it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, it's hard for people to, I guess, to grasp, like, you can have all the stuff that I want mm. and you can have the same issues that I do, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, so moving to the future, mm -hmm. what at this point in you guys' careers and lives, what does 
like future success look like to you? Where are you kind of aiming towards in terms of, you know, obviously, like we said, when you start, you have a certain idea of what success is. You kind of go through your career, it maybe changes a little bit and you achieve certain parts of it. And then now is success just sustainability or is it moving to a certain point or is it more an internal success or what's the, what success do you not have that you're aiming towards now? Um, I think it's kind of a, a bit of everything that you just mentioned. I think it's, it's internal as you grow each year, you think about, you know, so many things change in one year. And so I, I guess you start, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a person that loves to evaluate. Like I will sit and I'll go through and I think, oh, okay, this didn't really work. Why didn't it work? And, and all of that. And, um, I guess, yeah, internally I would be working on myself, of course. Um, I'd, I'm still obviously passionate about people chasing their dreams and it has nothing to do with dance. It's just literally chase your dream kind of thing. And, um, I, I, sometimes I get people met like message me or stop me and be like, Oh, but you're, you're practically living your dream. What do you mean? Chase the dream, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, the message is beyond me. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's something that I think resonates with everyone in any sort of practice that you want to do. And I think it's a message that needs to always kept being kept repeated because people get caught up in society and, um, you know, some people are working in a, in a place that they don't want to work or they do it for a period of time. But it's, it's that message to kind of say, well, that's fine because I used to do that. I used to work in, you know, retail for a very long time, but it's having a goal and knowing that I can do that and I'm working towards doing this. Mm -hmm. This is what makes me happy. This is, and if you can do what makes you happy for a living, Mm -hmm. Do you get what I mean? Job done. Yeah. And it's being able to duplicate that because, you know, I don't want to get political with schools and stuff, but when you're in school, how you learn is different to what you experience in, you know, when you get out into the real world. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's just facts. And mm -hmm. I think that's a narrative that I would like to implement change in as far as, you know, young people being able to realize that they can actually be their own boss if they want to, they can do the thing that they love to do and how to facilitate that and all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. the, and the brand obviously to expand and everything else that, you know, most companies would, would want for themselves. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think for me, I'm actually living through my, what, if you asked me six, eight months ago, um, I would have said this, but um, one of my main goals was to make dance my career. And I know it sounds mad for people who've known me for a while because I've been dancing yeah. for a long time, yeah. but it, it was never my career because I was always working in the corporate world yeah. for like 15 years. So in September, I made a decision to quit my full-time job and somehow, some way, I'm not homeless. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that. yeah, that was like a huge goal of mine and it was really scary, but it's been like, yeah, about five, six months now. Um, so yeah, that was one of my goals. And then I think the next stage for me is legacy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important, especially at my age. I feel like I've yeah. physically, I've done you know, a lot of the stuff that I said I wanted to do, include like dance with this artist, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but legacy, I think is important. Like if what I, look like I think if I decide to, especially because of the, the type of dance style that I'm currently teaching and promoting, which is African dance, um, I think it's important that if I decided to stop anything to do with dance and just strictly stay behind the scenes that I have people um, who I can pass the baton to who are going to keep the same work ethic, the same passion as I'm doing to spread um, that style and that culture and that movement beyond me. Um, that's really important. And not just on stage, I'm talking like in education and in, you know, so that's my, so I think even the way I train my dancers now is very different. Like it's not just, um, you know, I'm training you how to dance really well in this style. Like it's beyond, it's beyond that. So I think that's the next stage for me. And a personal goal of mine is to, is to have a, a dance studio here and back home. Sick. Well, so if any investors, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's a huge one specifically for um, underground styles, especially African and Caribbean 
dance. Um, I think that's, I've been thinking about that for such a long time. Um, so that's a, a personal one for me. Yeah, I think that's super, like the legacy thing is super important. It's mm -hmm. like even what I was saying about mm -hmm. looking at Flawless when we first, because I feel like me and you are similar sort of age, yeah, like yeah. when we, we were kind of similar let's, let's point. Let's not reveal. Yeah, yeah, let's not talk about how old we are. <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, like coming into the scene, I was looking at like people like Marlon, there's a million other people as well that I was looking at, but like without that legacy and without you guys being around mm. and active, like there's a lot of stuff that maybe I wouldn't have been inspired to do. And I think it's kind of like, maybe like we're getting to the time where it's our time to do that mm. for, for other people. And it's like, you know, some of the, some of the moments and I, the more I kind of get older and uh, are around more of the people who I used to, well, I still look up to, but like, mm -hmm me and you were playing basketball together and like yeah, yeah, yeah. hanging out with like Kemrick or whoever people that I was like I'm never going to get to speak to these people mm -hmm. and now I can kind of call my friends mm -hmm. it's like I have conversations with them and like some of the stuff I bring up they don't even remember like mm -hmm. I just saw Cisco in here before he didn't even really recognise me and I was like oh you're toy boy he's like oh but it's like these mm -hmm. people that I was like such a big figure to me yeah. or mm -hmm. Kemrick taught me how to wave like when I went to my first <laughs> competition he was like teaching me a technique mm -hmm. I don't think he even remembers that but it's like those moments are like inspired me to like teach and it's like mm -hmm. on the Kemrick thing like it was at that do you remember that club gel club gel the, it was like a mess of a competition <laughs> ages ago mm -hmm. Um, you got some yeah, they, memory. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But this is what I mean. So it's like um, he was judging, and then in, I did my thing, and it was rubbish. It was like the first time I ever really been on stage freestyling. And then just in the breaks, he came over to me, and he was like showing me different techniques to wave. It's like he didn't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. But it really like gave me this this thing of like it. it I understood how much that meant to me and I was like I want to give those moments to other dancers and mm -hmm. just go out of my way to say the odd thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's really mad that like he wouldn't even remember that but it's like mm. it kind of shows me how important like legacy mm. and doing these things are and being public about it and you know even with the podcast or whatever but 100%. just speaking about things and passing them on is like you can change the course of yeah. people's lives it's the, impact, isn't it? mm -hmm. it's the yeah. impacts and you don't even realize sometimes the impact you know that you that you have on other people and it like someone like marlon for instance it it's not necessarily like you know the big flashy things that marlon has done but for me if i was to give an example of how marlon's inspired someone like me it's the consistency it's like fuck me mate like, yeah. he's been doing this for a long time and it and honestly it takes mental strength and physical strength and if you look at all the different you know people that have come after him or people that he trains and like for me, for someone like me and for what I want to do, that's really important. Like when I look at someone like Marlon, I'm not saying that the flashy stuff isn't, isn't great because it is, but it just goes to show that like, you just never know how you impact people's lives. Yeah, like yeah, the thanks. example with Kenrick, it's like, he doesn't even bloody know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's still equally as Just want to throw it out there, Toebox is amazing. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I was in Toebox. Toebox yeah, is were. amazing still. <laughs> I was in Toebox. Marlon didn't come to the audition, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, man. But you know, it's funny, like, one of the things I remember, like, if you ask me, like, one of my, uh, I guess, main memories or things that I took away from Flawless, it's like something so random, but I remember, um, I think it was, like, Sammy and some of the Erdang people. Yeah. They told me, when we would start in Toy Box, they told me, like, oh, you know, Flawless, like, when they first started, like, they didn't do any shows for, like, a year, and they just trained. And, like, I don't know how true that is. Is that true, yeah. yeah. But it's, like, for me at that time, like, now, that makes so much sense. At that time, I was, like, a year? Yeah. <laughs> like, they just rehearsed for a year? Like, what did they even do? Like, and it's just, like, that was, like, one of my main memories of, like, people talking about like there was so many times like, we saw you guys at parties and I was like oh these guys are cool um, but like that was one thing I just remember someone saying that to me like oh you know they didn't do anything for a year and they just trained and I was like I got stick huh, for that for really? a long time <laughs> everyone because at the time it's, it's funny because the vision that I had for Flawless was where we are now then so I was quite ahead as a young person yeah. of like, How old were you? I, I can't started. remember on this thing. Numbers and stuff. <laughs> it's just numbers. Um, but yeah, when I well, I started young to be fair. So um, when that happened, um, I was still very much one of the you know main choreographers at Plague. I was also yeah. part of Boy Blue, yeah. and um, you know these are like original crews that are set like a complete different level to the UK um, street dance hip hop. Um, scene and um, 
they would the Florida boys would see me doing these shows so as far as they're concerned they're looking and they're like you're living the high life you're doing all these shows da, 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 and oh, we're we just here we can't get on stage you're not letting us get on stage and it was like the prep time for what they were trying to you know what I was trying to do with them it was to affect change and it was to be something new that people had never seen before the yeah. way we approach it all of that I was thinking about what the name was going to be mm. all of that in in that year and also most importantly I didn't believe in auditions right. and everyone was handpicked and the reason why was because through my experience and my career I was surrounded by a lot of people that would you know do exactly what is expected if you go to an, a job interview. Right, right. So if you go to a job interview and you really want a job and you want to make that money, then you say and do everything that you think you would, should, think say. You should yeah. say. And so that same narrative kind of crossed over to me in in dance. You know, right. I'd I'd been in crews and been in big companies and seen that you know sometimes you get a bad apple over there and yeah. do you know what I mean a loose a loose cannon over that side and We've and and for me I always say mentality over ability yeah so my whole drive was about building people up mentally yeah. that were passionate about sharing the same common goal and then kind of refining that and really nurturing that and getting everyone to get molded and all of that and that's kind of like why when flawless first came out even if i was blown away because our first competition we won Which and that was uh, uk championships oh, so um much. and um you know it was simply just because the prep time and the feeling it was just the right time in like what you said and somebody else could try and replicate that but the time that it was is completely different you know yeah yeah definitely um and so that was one thing that i'd say when it comes to cruise yeah. anyway yeah that was like something that i always took away of like it's that kind of that analogy of like um like pulling back that the bow and arrow thing is yeah, like you know yeah. you, the further you pull it back and then you're gonna let go it's gonna fly further it's mm. like if you just do that and let go mm. but it's like give it a year of prep time and because you're thinking yeah okay a year seems long but not if it's serving a 15 year career or talk, you know what it. I mean like this is it this is it so yeah I think that that's also something where it's like behind the scenes of success talking about that it's like it takes a lot of prep work <laughs> you can't just decide 100%. to do something yeah. and then... because now obviously we're in a time where crews are getting birthed daily yeah. my concern with the new side of hip hop is that you know um, students are teaching students yep. and so um, that part mm -hmm. it's, it's very important that uh, the person that's leading, like, is in the right position and understands what that responsibility looks like. And there's a difference between being a leader and a teacher and a choreographer. And so all these different roles, Absolutely. like, you yeah. know, um, coming from our generation, our time, it, it's it's a thing that you don't play around with you know you yeah, you have to treat like that was seriously about because yeah because it's legacy mm -hmm. because everything you know that moves on to continue you want to be able to know that that the students that you're teaching are developing and nurturing in the right way so that that could have a repetition mm -hmm. and it keeps going that way you know uh, otherwise it becomes dam damaging to our scene and we don't want that yeah. obviously so yeah I think that's mad important what you said about the difference between like a leader a teacher and a choreographer because I think for me I'm not so much mad at a group of friends getting together and starting yeah, something yeah, of course. if you're all amateurs and you're all boys or whatever it's just like cool go do your mm. thing and, and you might have one person who decides to be the leader like mm. alright I'm going to try this but if you're putting yourself forward as like I'm going to teach you stuff I'm going to it, it's a big responsibility yeah. like you know I mean I feel like that's a whole other podcast um, <laughs> but yeah I think it's probably time that we wrap up because yeah. uh, there's another talk coming in but thank you guys so much thank for thank you for having me coming. lovely to it's see you pleasure. both again um, and yeah thanks thank to Move It for having us and yeah. see everybody soon